<coughs> and uh, Naomi, Greg, thanks so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, as most of you know, I didn't come into this from background from a research thing. And I got into my job, and, and most of you think of it as a scientific job. Well, in a way, it is. I have two roles. It's political meteorologist and social meteorologist. <laughs> and the farther you get away from Miami and Washington, the better chance I have to learn new science. So while I'm out here, and I'll tell you about the political thing. How many of you got a tie on today? Come on, come on. Raise your hands. It's all, I got a tie on. I mean, there's two reasons to have a tie. One is to hold the microphone, and one is to satisfy the political meteorology. Washington, Washington. And Mike, I don't know what, I don't know what your story is, but you got a tie on today. You already got a job. What's your, who are you trying to impress? Yeah. OK, I'm, uh, why I say I'm blessed in my career. I started out in 1971. Uh, I'd been on four commercial airline flights, and the Navy thought I could be a flight meteorologist. My first flight down VW-4 was in a Super Connie. They put me in the cockpit to watch the flight. They're yelling at each other. We're rolling down the runway at Navy Jacksonville, and they pass refusal speed. They got to fly. Now they're really yelling at each other. One guy's yelling, dump, dump, dump. He's the hell out of me. I'd been on four commercial flights. Well, one of the engines had failed on the Connie. We were loaded for a 17-hour flight. Fuel was going into the St. John's River. Fuel was going over Arlington Golf Course. We had to fly three hours dumping fuel in the Atlantic to come back on there. I thought it was cool. <laughs> and such, is a career, such, a, such things are careers launched. <coughs> now, I'm a forecast junkie. I was forecasting before I knew what it was. Just for the, for the, and I still am. I get up every morning. I spend five or 10 minutes at home doing a five minute to 10 minute forecast for where I live. Uh, I'm just going to go through a, a hit on a lot of things. Uh, one, one point I want to make that I didn't include in the slides right off the bat. Uh, some, how many in here have actually made official forecasts that people make decisions on as part of your career? Fantastic. My first forecasting job in the 1970s, and then you flash forward to now. A guy presented at a conference. People were, again, whining about models or data and that sort of thing. Uh, did a calculation that in, in uh, uh, forecast office in 1975, uh, the, what the forecaster got to work with in the way of data and model output is the equivalent of what you get ingested in your computers now in the first eight minutes on shift. The job has changed from milking minuscule pieces of information and trying to make some sense out of it for what the forecast will be to taking this immense amount of information and compacting that into a reasonably good assessment of the best possible forecast of the day. Well, the Mayans who started, I, I go down to the Yucatan every now and then and fascinated about it. And I couldn't find, somewhere along the way, I'd seen uh, someone make an interesting uh, connection that so few of the Mayan ruins are on the coast. And it must be because they were smart enough to move away from hurricanes. How the hell could that be? They ended up getting wiped out. And we're a really smart society. We don't move away from the coastline. <laughs> and Google, as I made this weekend, I can't find the source that said it was hurricanes that moved. But I found another one that uh, stated, actually, the, 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 the reason they were inland is most of their enemies attack from sea. You move inland, they can't see you. Uh, I like the first one better, but hey. Uh, this is Tulum. Maybe that was the Mayan Hurricane Center, a place that gets hit a lot by there. And if you ever go down, have you ever been to Tulum? It's worth going to. It's, it's, a, it's a neat trip. It is built. It, it makes our hurricane center look relatively mild by comparison for sustainability. Uh, 1800 to 1900, uh, 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 how many of you read some of Vigna's, Father Vigna's work in there? It's fascinating stuff. Uh, the, the ability, when you don't have anything else, the ability to glean when you have an interest in it from what you're visually seeing Kind of reminds me of the early storm chasers. They had no access to data out in the plains. And some of the good ones seemed to find the best storms. And Venus and others and Cuba really set the stage for Caribbean type storms of the, what the advancing weather conditions, change in pressure and seas relative to hurricanes. Now, it didn't always work. And it didn't work anywhere close to what we have now. But it was the best they could do with what they had. Uh, observing networks didn't exist, not because they didn't take OBS. They didn't have a communication system. They took the odds, but you got them not in real time. 
And the settlement of, uh, from Columbus on eventually led to a reasonably good climatology of the hurricanes in the Western Atlantic. So anyway, the 12 hour or so forecast technique that you're about to ready to get whacked was based on these basic observations of sky pressure and seas. Having worked 16 years at the Galveston office and ostensibly the, a, a successor to Klein, who either gets praised or abused, depending which one of the stories you believe on the, on the, on the occasions that went on back then. <coughs> the early warning service of the Weather Service was all central east out of Washington. Okay? Uh, you basically got a, a short forecast sent to you for publication in a newspaper. No radio, no TV. Uh, Galveston actually had an early phone system about then, but it, it failed more than it worked. So door to door was how you got people word in a city where there was a weather bureau office. If you didn't live in the city where the weather bureau office is, you did not get any warning or forecast in 1900. Other than the citizens on the island recognizing or not what was happening. Signal flags were the way they were presented for a visual. Now how many of you remember Hurricane Ike and the video of it and the people pulling their lawn chairs out to the seawall to watch these big waves at the the beach. Anyone who's read the anecdotal accounts of citizens who survived the 1900 storms, the idiots and Ike were doing the same thing that people were then, only they didn't have, the people back then didn't have the benefit of history to teach them that. Why is it people don't learn? Thankfully, we've got other people who are going to talk about some of these social aspects because it's fascinating. We've got to solve those. I'm wheezing a bit. It's a bit of bronchitis. It's not contagious, I hope. Uh, 1900 to 1940, uh, Isaac Klein himself uh, and others really went to work at documenting a lot of what went wrong in some of the early uh, decade storms there. But not much had changed in the early part as far as that. The biggest things that happened was the ship to shore radio. So instead of finding out about a hurricane because a ship never returned, it sank and you assumed it was a hurricane. You now were getting observations from some of the ships. And as someone showed in, in the earlier talks, the relatively lack of upper air data, at least it was a beginning. There were some, some ideas on upper air, especially as we approached 1940. So we had basically were advancing some of the same conceptual models, first started by Vinas and others. Uh, 1935 is the timeline we use as the as the start of where we are now and the, the, the system we have now as far as hurricane the National Hurricane Center and hurricane warnings and forecasts, decentralization to Jacksonville, New Orleans, San Juan, and also a regional responsibility in DC. The uh, Jacksonville office eventually became what is now the Miami office. Uh, World War II advanced as wars seem to do a lot, a lot in the uh, meteorological area, and the aviation uh, was really a key to it, both in radar and what was learned by the planes flying through the through the weather they encountered. Uh, the picture of the plane there is an AT, uh, AT-6 trainer. Uh, this is the one that uh, first flew into a hurricane. Uh, the 1940, there was a hurricane in 1943 that came across Galveston Bay. There was a training base in Bryan, Texas. And, and again, fortuitously, the Galveston Historical Society was taking oral histories of this 43 hurricane and I got to play a part in, in listening to some of those. One of them that was with Ralph O'Hare, who happened to have been the navigator on that plane. And it really was a bar bet. The British said, your plane's a piece of crap. It can't even fly through a thunderstorm. And Duckworth said, oh, <laughs> there's a storm out here. We're going to fly through a few thunderstorms. And, and luck have it, he flew right into the eye of the storm, came back. The meteorologist had his ego hurt, so he made it. Duckworth take him out there again. Uh, with the meteorologist on board that time, and, and the rest is history as far as reconnaissance. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to fly into Gilbert in a single engine plane, but uh, that was a nice solid Cat 1 at the time. Uh, another thing that I don't see people talk much about is the experientially trained workforce that came out of, in operations, that came out of World War II. It fed the National Weather Service that existed from post-World War II to the 70s. And many of us in this room benefited from people that learned meteorology experientially, then went back to school, got their PhDs, and became uh, professors, instructors, and the like. Almost two-thirds of mine at A&M were World War II vets. 
And what they taught me was, the, here's the theory, but here's how you're going to have to use it. Here's why people need what you're doing. And I don't know if we've maybe lost some of that, because we pretty much have to teach the practical stuff from scratch from recent graduates when we hire them. This was a public advisory in the 1940s. Who knows, it may have been that same 1947 hurricane. And you'll say, my, they weren't, they didn't, they weren't very verbose then. And, and that's not true. They were just as verbose as we are now. They would have written paragraphs, pages. But we were hitting those to the, to the media and, and to other agencies on a 25-word-a-minute teletype. And lots of other offices were doing the same thing. So you had a, a character limit. It was the original Twitter. You had a hundred, whatever number of characters it was. You had a limit that you could pound out on, a, on an advisory. But the same basic information, uh, not nearly as much detail as we do now, is in these early advisories. Yeah, I decided to put, put the Godfathers one up there just for that good observation. Uh, we added observational tools during this, this period. The aircraft reconnaissance uh, grew and matured during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, early satellite, the coastal radar, getting the uh, coastal radar networks. Uh, that was the first uh, uh, network of radars was the 1957 uh, model of radars. And that's pretty close to what you would see on a, on a radar picture back then. Nothing like we have now. Uh, only a handful of people outside the weather office that existed at ever saw that information. <coughs> this is where uh, going beyond the persistence, climatology, experiential forecast began to transition in, into models. Uh, what do you want to bet the forecasters were resistant? My first meteorologist in charge in San Antonio was 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 reassigned from a senior duty meteorologist at NMC by Cressman, along with about 15 others, to force the field to use model output in their forecasting. It took a, it took a culture change from the World War II generation experiential meteorologists to the new people coming out with education on models to change that. Uh, so 1970, uh, there's our basic products, the marine, and the, uh, and the public uh, advisory product there. Uh, the warnings were 24 hours, and until this year, they had not changed. Uh, it went out via teletype. Uh, rip and read was the word of the day for radio stations. Television was on its way. So we're getting more information out in the public, but it's still uh, highly textual and highly schedule -driv driven. Uh, ever seen a tropical cyclone discussion that short before? <laughs> I don't think we had a name on it. Pardon? Wow, you must have been feeling bad. Ah, there you go. Uh, but anyway, the, again, you can see a lot of, there was a lot of teletype issues. You filled out forms. Uh, we probably had a whole team of staff that were called communicators. And actually, and that my first job at the forecast office was sitting there banging away on a teletype, getting our products out to the world. Uh, this was an example of how your computer guidance model input, you filled in a form, sent it up, it ran it, and, you, and then you plotted it. You get that a teletype back on the output, and you plotted it out there. Uh, by the late 70s, we were getting that in the field forecast offices. We plotted it out there, out there too. So we have an, uh, we're starting to begin to see the same information at that point that they could at the Hurricane Center in the forecast offices. OK. Uh, uh, the uh, Advancements now go very fast. The, uh, the uh, uh, center position, this is what we forecast. Center positions out to 120 hours. That's the track forecast. Uh, this year, we are going to a 36-hour warning, 48-hour watch. I had no idea how hard it would be to make a logical change. As much as it, all throughout the history of, of hurricane forecasts, in this country, and, and some of what you see in some of the products that have been issued in the past is uh, tur like tourism industry. We don't want to scare away our clients. I had people livid that we were going to go from 24 to 36 hours for the Florida Keys. And it takes 36 hours to evacuate them. Uh, that's the social and political meteorology side of the, the bet. The North Gulf Coast doesn't have that cultural issue. They were the ones pushing for this change. In fact, they wanted it to be longer. 
uh, products. Well, now there's no limit as to how much we can communicate. And we, we, we spew out two pages of an advisory, advisory on a storm that's a tropical storm. The local office, impacted by this storm, kind of, eight pages. How many of you guys read what hurricane local statements that our office issue? That's the same as the general public. And it's now the same as the media. And it's the same with our advisories. They're too long. I think this is where we're going. This is actually that same HLS, for all intents and purposes, put into a graphical format. And these are rude, crude, rude startups. We're, we're experimenting on the fly on some of this stuff. And we're, we're actually, there's people out there, last AMS conference uh, in Atlanta, there was people that have done some studies with people and trying to get a feel for how do we make our information impactful to the people that have to use it. Uh, most people have gone through all this. Uh, I don't want to underplay that the people don't make much of the hardware to up, the, to up to the task. The, the hardware that can run it faster and faster. For a modeler, it may not be all that important whether it gets done quickly or not, but for, for James and Richard, if you can't get that forecast information to them in the time frame they're making the forecast, it don't matter. It's all just a game. It has to get to you in time. Uh, for us, for, for the end, getting it to the end user, this is a, the exciting things that are going on now and seeing where that might go. In 1998, when Hurricane Mitch hit the uh, uh, Central America, I was actually on a family vacation with, with, staying with uh, Costa Ricans in Central Costa Rica. Uh, no phones. Television didn't cover it. Had no idea there was a big storm going on. Now, you go to Costa Rica, this, this, these people lived in a barrio, uh, average annual income of the folks in that neighborhood is about $2,000. Everyone has a cell phone. And you know what? We're working on getting warnings through cell phones. Guatemala has that set up with a flood warning system. The ability to communicate that down to the individual is the key to success on what we do. Personalize the threat. They can see the pictures on the TV, they can see our graphics. But if they can't relate, what does this mean to me? It's not going to work. So the key is, how do you make it relate to them? So what we're working on is how to clearly convey what is meant. Social scientists and local communities and media working on how to get that to them. Uh, what hasn't been talked about much today is it's still uncertainty. I don't care. Uh, somewhere along the way, we're going to reach limits of predictability on all this stuff. Uh, I'm not a big fan of extending the forecast out in time because people don't use uncertainty. There are not enough resources. Hurricane Gustav is moving towards Louisiana. A decision to move planes, trains, and automobiles to evacuate New Orleans was made in 96 hours. If that storm at, at somewhere around 72 to 48 hours had veered closer to Texas, there was no way you could move the resources to evacuate Lake Charles, Beaumont, Port Arthur for an advancing hurricane. Uh, Craig Fugate, director of FEMA, agrees. He thinks we should be actually pulling back and, and making the tightest schedules we can. The advantage of a long-term forecast may play out in some industries, but not for the key life-saving issues of, of evacuation. Uh, many of you have seen this, the track. I don't know where this is going to end. I would assume at some point we'll hit a level of predictability, but as someone pointed out, the original studies on that we've we long since passed. If we just continue our trends, we'll meet, meet our HFIP goals this decade. To me, that's, just, uh, that's totally phenomenal, but we shall see. What does that mean graphically? Here's the 96-hour forecast for Ike when it was south of Cuba. And that, it, was, it was forecast here. It made landfall there. If the same relative cone with the improvement were to show up, uh, the storm would be uh, located more towards Corpus Christi than Houston. If we can get that kind of skill on that time frame, then the allocation of resources will be limited to a smaller area, and there'll be enough left in case we have a big bust. That's why it's important to keep the, the track forecast skill improving. We talked about the intensity. Uh, we're more skeptical, I guess, because we're end users and we've seen no progress, uh, either in our guidance or our own forecasts. But this one, this is a real storm. I think it was Felix couple of years ago. Let's pretend instead of 
Felix. It's a, it's, a, it's a new storm in the southern Gulf of Mexico moving north or northwest. 35 knot storm. All our guidance forecasts 48 hours to be 65 knots or less. Okay, I add a category for decision makers. I got a, a low end Cat 2 storm. How many of you think anyone will evacuate on that forecast? The Houston area, the Galv uh, and the New Orleans area need to evacuate starting at 48 hours. 24 hours later, our storm's moving north. It's now at 60 knots. How many of you think people evacuate? Say we're forecasting it. We're off that much there. We're forecasting 48 hours to be at 95 knots. How many of you think they'll pull the plug at 24 hours on evacuation? They probably can't pull off. Stay and, and hope it works or go and, hope and fear a busted uh, evacuation. So instead, the storm rapidly intensifies, makes landfall at 145 knots. It's going to happen someday. I hope I'm retired, because I don't think the repercussions are going to be nice. And it's as much social as meteorological. <laughs> there you go, folks. Thank you very much.